I want you to turn to the prophecy of Amos. Uh, remember, we're in the Minor Prophets. We've moved past Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. We have come through Hosea and Joel. And now we're looking at Amos. Uh, Amos, chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. And then we're going to read chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. I would ask you to stand with me as we read from God's Word. If you don't have your Bibles, we've got the text on the screens for you. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And then chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. What is this? This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God, and we want to hear it tonight with all of the pathos that was there when it was delivered by Amos, who lived in the southern kingdom, near the border, to be sure, but was called of God to prophesy to the northern kingdom. An unenviable task, to be sure. Thank you. Please be seated. I would remind you, just very quickly, John 5, 39 to 40 is the, is the theme that is driving this, this search for Jesus in all of the Scripture. When Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. We're going to watch at this time now the, uh, the video from the Bible Project, a brief uh, summary, uh, excellent summary, by the way, of the book of Amos. The book of the prophet Amos. Amos was a shepherd and a fig tree farmer who lived right near the border between northern Israel and southern Judah. Now the north had seized its independence about 150 years earlier, remember 1 Kings chapter 12, and it was currently being ruled by Jeroboam II, a successful military leader. He won lots of battles and new territory for Israel, and he generated lots of wealth, but in the eyes of the prophets, he was one of the worst kings ever. His wealth had led to apathy, and he allowed idol worship for the gods of Canaan, which in turn led to injustice and the neglect of the poor. And it got to the point where Amos could couldn't take it anymore. He sensed God calling him to go trek up north to Bethel, an important city that had a large temple, and start announcing God's word to the people. And this book is a collection of his sermons and poems and visions uttered over the years. They were compiled later to give God's people a sense of his divine message to the northern kingdom, and it's a message we still need to hear today. The book has a fairly clear design. Chapters 1 and 2 are a series of messages to the nations and Israel. Then chapters 3 to 6 are a collection of poems that express Amos' message to the people of Israel and its leaders. Chapters 7 through 9 contain a series of visions that Amos experienced that depict God's coming judgment on Israel. Let's just dive in. So the book opens with a series of short poems that accuse all of Israel's neighbors of violence and injustice. And this is kind of odd because the book's opening line said that Amos was going to speak against Israel. But watch how this works. As Amos is naming all of these neighboring nations, you can go look at a map and see that he's creating a circle. And when he's done, Israel lies right in the center, like a target in the crosshairs. And on Israel, Amos unleashes a poetic accusation that's three times longer and more intense than any of these others. He accuses Israel's wealthy of ignoring the poor and allowing grave injustice in their land, specifically by allowing the poor 
were to be sold into debt slavery and then going on to deny any of these people legal representation. And this, Amos asks, is this the family that was once denied justice and enslaved in Egypt? The family that God rescued from oppression and slavery? The party's over, Amos says. God is done putting up with you. And so the opening of the next section explains why. God says, I chose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth. This is an allusion to Genesis 12, how God had called the family of Abraham to become God's blessing to all of the nations. And so then God says, so this is why I will punish you for all of your sin. Israel had a great calling which came with great responsibility, and so their sin and rebellion brings great consequences. Now this section brings together a lot of Amos's poems, and you'll see a few key themes repeated over and over. So first, he's constantly exposing the religious hypocrisy of Israel's wealthy and their leaders. And he describes how they faithfully attend the religious gatherings, giving offerings and sacrifices, all the while neglecting the poor and ignoring injustice. And Amos says it's all a sham, that God actually hates their worship because it's totally disconnected from how they treat people. God says a real relationship with him will transform a person's relationships. And so Amos's call to true worship is to let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. Now these two words, they're super important for Amos and actually all of the prophets. So righteousness, or in Hebrew tzedakah, refers to a standard of right, equitable relationships between people no matter their social differences. And justice, or in Hebrew mishpat, refers to concrete actions that you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. And so both of these are to permeate the life of God's covenant people like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. The next theme is Amos' repeated accusations of Israel's idolatry. So remember, when the northern kingdom broke away from southern Judah, their king built two new temples to rival Solomon's in Jerusalem, and he placed a golden calf in each. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12. Since then, Israel had only accumulated more idols, worshiping the gods of sex and weather and war. And in the prophet's view, the worship of these gods always led to injustice because these gods don't require the same degree of justice and righteousness as the God of Israel, not to mention that these gods were immoral themselves. Not the God of Israel, he's different. So he can say in one place, seek me that you may live. And then right after that say to Israel, seek good, not evil that you may live. So true worship of the creator God of Israel, it's synonymous with doing good, with generosity and with justice. And so the final theme in these chapters is that because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and the other prophets, God will send the day of the Lord. This is a great and terrible act of justice on Israel. And specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate their cities and take the people away into exile. And we know his prediction came true. Some 40 years later, the Assyrian Empire swooped in and did exactly as Amos had said. The book closes with a series of visions that Amos experienced and their symbolic depictions of the coming day of the Lord. So he sees Israel devastated by a locust swarm and then by a scorching fire and then they're being swallowed up like overripe fruit. And in the final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's great idol temple at Bethel and the whole building comes crumbling down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the gods of Israel. Their end has finally come come. But then, all of a sudden, in the final paragraph, we see a glimmer of hope. It picks up this image of Israel as a destroyed building, and God says that out of the ruins, he will one day restore the house of David. In other words, he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line, and he will rebuild the family of God's people, which, surprisingly, we're told, is going to include people from all of the nations. All of the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will that day be reversed. Now, this final paragraph is super important. It's the only sign of hope on the other side of judgment. And it helps us see how this book is exploring the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. If God is good, he has to confront and judge evil among Israel and the nations. But his long-term purposes are to restore his world and build a new covenant family. And so through Amos's words, we still today hear his call to learn from Israel's hypocrisy and disaster and to embrace a true 
true worship of this God, which should always lead to justice and righteousness and loving our neighbor. And that's what the book of Amos is all about. Another excellent video summary. Amos prophesied during a period of national optimism in Israel. Business was booming, boundaries were bulging, but beneath the surface, greed and injustice were festering. Uh, hypocritical religious motions had replaced true worship creating a false sense of security and a growing callousness to God's disciplining hand. Famine, drought, plagues, death, destruction, none of, none of this seemed to bring the nation to their knees. So enter Amos, a country farmer called by God to be a prophet. And he lashes out lashes out at sin unflinchingly, trying to get the people to visualize the nearness of God's judgment and hopefully mobilize the nation to repentance. But the nation, like a basket of rotting fruit, one of his images, stands ripe for judgment because of its hypocrisy and spiritual indifference. Put a time frame, I think you heard the authors of the Bible Project and the video. Uh, the time, timing of this prophecy is 760 to 753 BC. Um, 40 years later, of course, would be what? 722 BC. When what happens? The Assyrians conquer the Northern Kingdom. The place it takes, it, it, it mentions these surrounding nations and then specifically the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Uh, before we get into some more of the summary, I want to read for you how Amos begins. Chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Two years before the earthquake. And this earthquake, we'll cite this, is mentioned several times uh, in, in various writings of the prophets. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus, cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon, and him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden, and the people of Syria shall go into exile to Ker, says the Lord. I just want to give you a flavor of how this opens up. And you're going to see something like this repeating itself. So when you break down the book itself, I want to do a quick summary, and then we're going to go back and do a more extended summary of the book. It has eight prophecies, three sermons, five visions, and five uh, promises. There is a, there's a, a judgment of sin, of the sin of Israel. Uh, the pictures, let's look at these here. Trace it out here. Under the eight prophecies, the judgment of Israel and surrounding nations, chapter 1, 1 to 2, 16. Uh, there's three sermons between chapter 3 and chapter 6. It speaks of the sin of Israel, the present, past, and future. So notice the movement as, as was described in the video. There's this touching the outlying areas and then zeroing in, focusing in on Israel itself. Five visions take in the, the pictures of judgment of Israel. 7, chapter 7, 1 through chapter 9, verse 10, and then these five promises. And we'll look at this in a little while. Chapter 9, verse 11 to 15, speaking of the, of the restoration of Israel. So when you see the movement, look at the bottom section. You see the movement. You have pronouncements of judgment, provocations for judgment, the future of judgment, 
and then promises after judgment, that is, hope. Amos's message of doom, of the coming doom of the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, seems to them when he delivers it preposterous. Their external circumstances have never looked better in the north. It's a time of booming business, bulging boundaries, as I said, soaring optimism. What's that sound like to you? We're in the early throes of it, but wouldn't you say that that would be a description? I mean, everybody's excited about uh, Trump's tax cut and, and all these businesses are coming and saying, look, we're going we're gonna, to uh, give our employees a raise. We're going to give our employees bonuses. We're, we're moving. I read today uh, Campbell's Soup moving from Canada to the U.S. And I mean, there's a lot of encouragement, a lot of optimism. But let's learn from the days of Amos. Those are external circumstances. However, the internal conditions at the same time of Israel had never looked worse. Injustice, greed, hypocrisy, oppression, and arrogance. When Amos brought his earnest and forceful message against Israel's sins and abuses, it was, to say the least, poorly received. He's been called the prophet of Israel's Indian summer. He gives a very painfully clear message in chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. When we think about the, the eight prophecies, I read you a little bit of a flavor of this language that that comes up. It's a, as I said, or it's an unenviable task. You could see people saying, well, what do you know? I mean, you're a, you're a farmer and a fig grower from the Southern kingdom. Who are you to come tell us what God's going to do? Look at what, and here, think about, think like a Jew, look at how God's blessing. There's no, there's no indication here that we are looking at judgment. God is blessing us richly. Each of these eight prophecies or oracles. Remember, we talked to you before, there's this, this burden of the Lord that comes upon the prophet, this heaviness that he must speak the truth. They each begin with this for three transgressions and for four. There's this there's three, but there's more than that is the, is the message there. And the fourth transgression in this kind of Hebrew language is sort of like this is the last straw. The iniquity of each of the eight countries mentioned is full. Amos begins with the nations that surround Israel as his catalog of catastrophes gradually spirals in on Israel herself. Seven times in the course of this, he says, I will, God, God declares through Amos, I will send a fire. Let's look at those seven times just real quickly. Chapter 1, verse 4. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael. It shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. Chapter 1, verse 7. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour her strongholds. Verse 10. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it shall devour her strongholds. Verse 12. I will send a fire upon Taman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Basra. 14. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. In chapter 2, verse 2. I will send a fire upon Moab. It shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth, and Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then verse 5, I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. All these things about fire, this is a symbol of judgment. I will come in judgment, God is saying. What about the three sermons? Well, the three sermons are introduced in, in each place by, hear this word. Look at this, chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. In chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this word, 
that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. First sermon is, is a general pronouncement of judgment because of Israel's iniquities. The second one uh, exposes the crimes of the people, describes the way that God has chastened them in order to draw them back to himself. Five times in this section, the second sermon, yet you have not returned to me. The third sermon lists the sins of the house of Israel and calls the people to repent. But they hate integrity, justice, and compassion. Their, their refusal to turn to Yahweh will lead to their exile. Although they arrogantly wallow in luxury, their time of prosperity will suddenly come to an end. So you have these eight prophecies, these three sermons, and you have these five visions. Visions of coming judgment upon the northern kingdom. The first two are locusts and fire. But they do not come to pass because Amos intercedes and the Lord relents. Third vision is the plumb line. You're probably very familiar with that of all of these, followed by the only narrative section of the book of Amos. We're going to read that in a minute. Remember the plumb line? I'm not a builder now, okay? I'm going to tell you what I've read about it. In fact, if I tried to build a wall with a plumb line, it would be disastrous. I would start at the bottom with brick and mortar and do my best to keep that thing coming up. And then at the right time, when you drop a plumb line, here's what you would have. Have the plumb line dropping straight, which is what it does. And the wall would probably be something like this. So a plumb line doesn't make a wall straight, does it? A plumb line exposes how straight or how crooked a wall is. And that's what this picture of a plumb line, that God has dropped a plumb line upon his people and exposed their crookedness. But look at seven, um, Amos 7, verses 10 to 17. I just want to read this narrative portion, which is different than the literary genre of the rest of the book. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel must go into exile away from his land. He's talking about the captivity coming. Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, it's another word for prophet, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. It is a temple of the kingdom. Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. You've heard it said, I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet. That's where it comes from. I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Now here's, that don't do this anymore. So since you've said that, here's what the Lord says now. Your wife shall be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel shall surely go into exile away from this land. Well, you know, of course, that, that, that won him a lot of friends. No, it didn't. It simply intensified. The hostility. So Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, wants Amos to go back. And the fourth vision pictures Israel as a basket of rotten fruit, overripe for judgment. The fifth vision is a relentless portrayal of Israel's unavoidable judgment. And the book ends with five promises, though. Chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. He has thundered relentlessly of the coming divine retribution through, through prophecies, sermons, or visions. But he ends his book on a note of consolation, not condemnation. God promises to reinstate the Davidic line, to renew the land, and to restore the people. Let's, let's just read those, those brief verses before we move into looking at the title itself. Amos 9, 11 through 15. In that day, then the day here is talking about after the destruction, after the captivity. In that day. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David, 
that has fallen and repair its breaches. We think the booth of David is. Fire. And rebuild it as in the days of old. And they may possess the remnant of Edom. Who's Edom? Do you remember? Edom is the heritage, the offspring of, uh, of Esau. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. Do you have that picture in your mind? The plowman will overtake the reaper. The, 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 everything is growing so quickly. The treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. That they're already harvesting. They're already replanting. It is so bountiful. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord. One of the richest, it's, it's very brief. I mean, you think about chapters 1, 1 through 9, 10. It's about scorching, scathing judgment. But 11 through 15 gives such great promise that it really, even though it's brief, counterbalances all of the, of the warnings of judgment. Well, let's look at, let's look at, the, at the introduction and the title of this prophecy. I've already told you things were booming uh, in the northern kingdom. Underneath the underbelly, though, was, there was hypocrisy. God hates their worship. It's, it's foul and offensive to him. The name Amos is derived from the Hebrew root, which actually says Amos, which means to, to lift a burden, to carry. His name means burden bearer. Now you think, how in the world? I mean, he's just, everything he is saying for the vast majority of the prophecy is, uh, is very uh, damning, very, very threatening, very discouraging. But he is, he is bearing the burden the Lord has for his people and is bringing a message that's not popular because of the Lord's love for his people. He is bearing the burden of the Lord. And he's bearing up, as one writer said, bearing up under the burden of declaring exactly what the Lord intends for him to declare. Now, the author of this, the only Old Testament appearance of the name Amos is in this book. It's the only place it shows up. Now, don't be confused. There is a, there's a name, A-M-O-Z, Amos. But Amos is the father of Isaiah. This is Amos. He says, we read a while ago, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. I was a herdsman and a tender of sycamore trees. So he was a, he was a, a shepherd and he tended trees. Okay. But he's gripped by God and divinely commissioned to bring this prophetic burden to Israel. Look at Amos 3.8. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? He says, I, I have a holy fear before the Lord of what he's called me and commissioned me to do. Chapter 7, verse 15. The Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. The, uh, the area of Tekoa was a rural area, and it was about... Uh, 12 miles south of Jerusalem. And one of the writers said, I thought it was, that he tended a, a special breed of small sheep that, that produced wool of a fine quality. Another interesting side note, this, I just found this interesting as I was reading the sycamore uh, fruit, that, uh, the sycamore figs that he tended, he had to puncture the fruit. I hope no one's running home to eat figs. 
He had to puncture the fruit before it ripened to allow the insects inside to escape. You probably don't have those kind of figs in your house, but if you're going to eat them soon, you just might want to go ahead and puncture them just to be on the safe side to see if anything needs to come out before you eat it. We used to have two fig trees in our backyard. I love the figs. To this day, Karen loves fig preserves uh, when we can get a hold of them. Uh, but So that's, that's what he was doing as a tender of the fruit. Even though he was from the country, uh, when you read his prophecy, there are, there are several uh, references to the Pentateuch, to the, to the books of the law. He seems to be very familiar with that. Uh, he has a real keen sense of morality and justice, which probably comes from his understanding and exposure to the Pentateuch. And he seems to have a pretty accurate appraisal of, of Israel's spiritual condition, comparing it to what God's standard is. Bethel, which be, by the way, you know this, Beth is the word house. Bethlehem is house of bread. Messiah, the bread of life, is born in Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethel is Beth, house, El, God, the house of God. Bethel was the residence of the king of Israel, but because of the influence, also became the center of idolatry in the nation. It was very unpopular. The date and the setting of Amos says he, that he prophesied in chapter 1, verse 1, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So Uzziah was the king in the southern kingdom. Jeroboam the second, the king in the northern kingdom, the son of Joash, two years before the earthquake. Um, we, know that, we know from other studies that Uzziah reigned from 767 to 739 B.C., Jeroboam II reigned from 782 to 753 B.C. You've got an overlap there. I leave an overlap from, from 767 to 753 B.C. Over 200 years later, Zechariah referred to this earthquake during Uzziah's reign, and we won't look at it tonight, but Zechariah 14.5. And then Amos anticipates, we're going to look at this again, 7.11, anticipates the 722 B.C. Assyrian captivity of Israel. Look, 7.11. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel must go into exile away from this land. And so when you piece these things together, <clears throat> the, the time of, of writing, Jeroboam II was not dead because he's referred to in, in the opening verses as the king. Amos prophesied in Bethel about 755 B.C. So, uh, and again, one of the historians I was reading said that about this time, in, in June 15, 763 B.C., uh, there was a solar eclipse that took place in Israel. So when you see things like chapter 8, verse 9, and on that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon, and darken the earth in broad daylight. They would have had a familiarity with what that was like in the recent astronomical phenomena. For time sequence for Amos among the prophets, he ministered after the time of Obadiah, Joel, and Jonah, and just before Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. So he's in between those, those folks. Uzziah in the, in the south reigned over a prosperous, uh, militarily successful Judah. He subdued the Philistines, uh, the Ammonites, the Edomites. In the north, Israel was ruled by, the, by King Jeroboam, as was said in the video. He was very successful in his military campaigns. Uh, they were almost ideal military situation, economic situation. But sadly, prosperity only increased the materialism, immorality, and injustice of the people. That's why I think we need to, we need to watch with caution uh, what's happening in our country. I thank God for the leader we have. I thank God that he's able to survive so far 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, relentless assault uh, from 
from people who have, do not have a, a, a moral agenda. We need to pray to God that we will not go the way of the people uh, who were experiencing God's positive touch on their prosperity in the days of Amos. Look at this in Amos chapter 2, verses. I want to read some passages that kind of give you a flavor. Chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Another flavor of this, Amos 3.10. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Chapter 4, verse 1. You're going to hear this again a little later, but this is not a very flattering description of the women who are practicing injustice. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You've planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, who turn aside the needy in the gate. Chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale. Notice what they're talking about, violating, a clear violation of the Sabbath. That we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. Now, they were not saying this. This is the prophet saying, this is what you might as well be saying, given what you're doing that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. Just false dealings, treacherous, no moral standard, no scruples. Now, during these same years, the surrounding nations, Assyria, uh, Babylon, and Syria, Syria and Assyria, two different nations, uh, were fairly weak. So the people in Israel found it hard to imagine that any nation could come against them and defeat them. With Jeroboam on the throne, uh, if I could say this in, in, in contemporary parallel, with Jeroboam on the throne who had easily defeated ISIS within a year, they had no concept of how they could be taken by a foreign enemy. But it was only three decades only 30 years until Israel fell. What's the theme of this book? Well, it's the coming judgment of Israel because of the holiness of Yahweh and the sinfulness of his covenant people. Now, you've heard variations on this theme throughout the prophets, but that's, that's what it comes down to. The judgment of a holy God upon a sinful people whom he has blessed. God is a gracious God. He is patient. But He is just and He is righteous. And He will not allow sin to go unpunished indefinitely. The sins of Israel, in, in graphic language, are heaped as high as heaven. Empty ritualism. They would go through the motions, but they were a people, like God had said before, they worship me with their lips, but their heart's not there. They oppress the poor, practice idolatry, practice deceit, full of self-righteousness, full of arrogance, greed, materialism, callousness. They've broken repeatedly every aspect of their covenant relationship with God. Yet God continues to offer mercy and deliverance if they will only turn. 
Even though Amos spends much time in in a thundering and, and unrelenting warning of judgment, it is a mercy that God has sent him. Think about this. I used to say to my children when they were growing up, and, and they would get caught doing something. We would take the proper uh, form of discipline with them. That it's a mercy that the Lord allowed you to be caught. Because when you begin to get good at sin, the danger to your soul. May I have five children, three of whom understand that. Two of whom think they're getting away with their sin when I know they are not. Never forget, it's a mercy. It's a mercy when the Lord disciplines us. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Amos is a reformer, warning the people of Israel of their fate if they will not repent. But they reject his plea over and over, and judgment takes its course. So what are the keys to Amos? Well, the the key phrase, sometimes it's a key word, but the key phrase here is the judgment of Israel. The key verses we read at the outset to open up this study. I'll read them again. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Just a moment, I want you to... You only have I known. This is a prime example of the word no, K-N-O-W, in Hebrew. That word is not used, usually, of awareness. It is used of intimate relationship. You only have I had an intimate relationship of all the litany of nations in the world, God says. Remember in Genesis Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. It's that kind of language. It's, a, it's an intimate relationship. And God said, I've only had a relationship with you. You may be surprised at what he says after that. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Because you are a special people. You bear my name. Your iniquities will not go unpunished. The other nations may appear to go unpunished. David asked the question, why do the heathen rage? Why do the heathen prosper? Why do they seem to get away with it? There's there's no getting away with sin, you know. But it's the appearance sometimes. And the answer is that God loves his people too much not to chasten us in our iniquities. And then chapter 8, verse 11 to 12. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. This is fascinating what he says here. A famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And you go on and say, well, they shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. There are two things happening here. This this dullness of hearing, this, this famine of the word. They do not, they will not value hearing from the Lord. There are a lot of people that don't value that tonight. The idea of gathering under the authoritative teaching and preaching of the word, they're dull to it. They don't need it. But it's not just that. When the stirring comes and they need it, God will remove it. They will wander all over looking for it. I I need a word from the Lord. I, I need to hear from the Lord. And they won't find it. So it's a twofold judgment, a dullness that comes over the people, and then when they are stirred to realize they need the Lord, he will not provide. And remember, at the end of the, of the days of the prophets, 400 years of silence where there was not one, thus saith the Lord, spoken to the people God's choosing. So he says the days are coming when you will look for that. The key chapter is chapter 9. Chapter 9 is uh, in, one of the, in, in that harsh, uh, one of the harsh judgments of Amos. Uh, becomes this great promise of restoration. In just five verses, the future of Israel becomes clear. And if you go back and read them, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenants are focused on on their climactic fulfillment in the return 
of the Messiah. So these brief verses, chapter 9 is the key because it does not leave us with gloom and doom and discouragement. You know, God carries out every word prophesied in chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 10. There is promise and hope held out. Where do we see Jesus in, uh, in Amos? Well, we, we go to the, uh, uh, we know that he's implied in God's authority to judge. But we see him in Amos 9, 11 to 15. So let's go back to that and look at this. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David. This symbol of one of the, the festival of booths. God's provision, his caring. The booth of David is the one in whom the people will take shelter. The one in whom they will find relief, comfort, nourishment. It has fallen and repair its breaches. Will raise up its ruins and rebuild it in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord. There's the promise to Abraham. Look around you. See what you can see. So shall your offspring be. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains will drip sweet wine. All the hills shall... You get the imagery there? When, when there will be real prosperity, spiritual prosperity, when you, will, when you will, as the psalmist says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing I need. The days are coming. Verse 14, I'll restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They shall, they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. This idea of, of restoration, reformation, recovery, rebuilding. Make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land. They shall never again be uprooted out of the land. Well, some, of course, obviously take that. that you could say there's a partial immediate fulfillment when, when Israel returns to the land. 1963, but, but the ultimate fulfillment is when we're in a place where we will not depart. In that great place where, where righteousness dwells, where Jesus reigns, where the Lord God omnipotent lives. So there's Jesus in the, in the message of hope. Though we know that he has the authority to judge, we know that from Revelation. What about his contribution to the scriptures? <clears throat> well, Amos gives us what some might call a disproportionate measure of judgment versus hope and blessing. Chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 10. Judgment, judgment, threatening, promise, judgment. Daunting. You read through the Bible and you get to Amos, and you've done it before, you can't wait to get to chapter 9, verse 11, because it is, it is withering when you read it. So it's more than any of the other prophets. One writer said that Amos stands alone as one of the most direct and incisive prophets. We move back to chapter 4, verse 1. This had to be a crowd pleaser. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. That's how he described. This is, this is right up there with calling someone a Corinthian woman in Paul's day. In other words, you gorge for yourself. And he even mocks them when he says, you say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Let us just, let's just consume it all on ourselves. Amos was the first of two writing prophets to the northern kingdom. We've looked at chapter 3, verse 1. We'll look at chapter 3, verse 12. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and a part of a bed. And of course, we read the section in chapter 10 where he, 
where he encounters Amaziah, the priest. But unlike Hosea, who was the other messenger to the northern kingdom, Amos was a resident of Judah. He's he's an alien. He's a foreigner. He highly resented. That's what Amaziah, Amaziah says. How dare you come and speak to us? Go back home. Go prophesy back where you came from. So somebody did this, and I, I, I don't know if I was able to get this on the screen or not. It was in sort of a, a column form. But I want to just read this to you if it's not up there. Comparing Hosea and Amos, these two prophets to the northern kingdom. Hosea preached against idolatry. Amos preaches against injustice. Watch the difference. Hosea commands the people to know God. Amos commands the people to seek God. Hosea rebukes religious iniquities. Amos rebukes social inequities. Amos aims at their worship of God, how they worship. Pardon me, Hosea does. Amos aims at their walk with God. Hosea stresses the need for the knowledge of God. Amos stresses the need for justice. See what's happening here. Hosea was emphasizing this uh, a right thinking and a right relationship with God. Amos is saying, practice it. Show it. And Hosea, God spoke through him, I don't delight in your sacrifices. Amos, I hate your offerings, God said. That's a great fundraiser, isn't it? We're going to have a, we're going to have a, a big in gathering today. I'm going to read from Amos. God says, I hate your offerings. Strong language. Hosea says, majors on, on image worship. Amos doesn't say much about image worship. Hosea describes, this is where they're alike, describes Israel as a privileged people. Amos describes Israel as a privileged people. You can go on and on and on. They're contrasted, but these were the two. Hosea lived there. Amos is sent there from outside. Hosea emphasizes uh, the grace of God. Amos emphasizes the righteousness of God. Hosea emphasizes the love or loving kindness of God. Amos emphasizes the wrath of God. Hosea had a sympathetic tone. Amos, a stern tone. As I said earlier, he, he reflects. I want to go through these quickly. I want to see, let you see where he, his preaching comes right out of the Pentateuch. Just real quickly, I want to read this to you. In Amos 2, 7, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. None of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow. For both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Chapter 2, verse 8 of Amos. Lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Exodus 22, 6. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. See, these images he uses come right out of the Pentateuch. Amos 2, 12. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Number six, one to three. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. Say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. See the contrast there? And this goes on several times in the book. I want to move to the last section though, where Amos quotes, Amos is quoted 
in Matthew, Acts, and Rome. So with Romans, we see the New Testament. Amos 4.11, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Romans 9.29, Isaiah predicted if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Amos 5, 25 to 27, picked, it's picked up in Acts 7, 42 and 43. Look at Amos. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikoth, your king, and Kiun, your star god, your images that you may, made for yourselves. See the, what they're doing there? And I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Acts 7. Description of this, verse 42 and 43. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, that, that star God. As it is written in the book of the prophets, did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices? So you see the reference there. The name is 8, 9. On that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Matthew 24, 29, the little apocalypse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. Powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then uh, one more cited in Acts. Look at Amos 9, 11, and 12. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. You heard me read this already, so you know what this is saying. Let's look at Acts 15. Verses 16 to 18. After this, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. The booth of David, tent of David. You see the connection? I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. So, so that's Amos's contribution, if you please, to the Bible. Any questions or observations that, that you want to make uh, as we've, as we've looked through this tonight or maybe in your own reading that you'd like to share.